So, for those who don't know you, Velma, just tell us uh, who you are, just a, a quick snapshot of, of a little bit about yourself. Right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Velma Troco. Actually, when I write my name, I write Velma Major Troco, because my father was major and my husband was Troco. And I originally come from Liberia. It's a small country in West Africa. And we moved to the UK in 1990. Um, my husband and I and our three, three children when we came, and then we had the fourth one when we arrived in Liverpool, and we were there for two years, and then we came to uh, Birmingham for five months. <laughs> been it. And we've been here since 1992. Now that's more than five months in any... Yes, we didn't originally come to live in the UK. We came because my husband was uh, being trained as an orthopedic surgeon, and we were going back to Liberia um, to work in a Christian hospital uh, uh, with SIM. And, uh, but circumstances and things happened in our country. Just before we left, a war started there, and the war went on and on and on, and so after um, five years, we still couldn't go back. Um, I trained originally as a doctor. Um, I did a lot of work in pediatrics and general medicine, and I loved medicine. But when we came to the UK, we made some decisions, some very hard decisions, that I would be a stay-at-home mom and look after the family, and if we had time, before we went back, I would get some training in tropical medicine, which I did in the meantime while we were here. Uh, I trained as a uh, specialist in tropical medicine because that's what we see in Africa most of the time. But then I never did get the chance to go back and practice tropical medicine. But in a way, it's sort of, that's why I learned even before I came to the UK. I have... I've got four children. Well, they're not children anymore. They're all adults now. Um, the oldest is Grace, and she lives in Munich. She's married to a German. And um, that's another... Well, she is the, the real part of why I wrote this story about this Grace who lives in Germany now. And the second uh, child is Ab. Archibald and Ab lives in Cape Town. He's married to a South African who is also British, and they met here. And um, that's another God's great story as well. So, um, and what's the next? No, oh, I've got a third, Joy, who is... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's Joy. She sits up here, and Joy is an obstetrician gynecologist, and she works in, uh, in Coventry. And she's got two little beautiful girls, Debbie and Izzy. And Joy is married to Tosin. And um, they live about 10 minutes from here um, in New Oscott. And the last one is Gail. And Gail is, uh, is not married. She lives in Mia Green. And uh, she's a, a business analyst. And uh, she was born in the UK in 1998 in Liverpool before we moved to Sutton. OK. Brilliant. So you've got this book. Why wave the book at us and tell us why you've written a book. Right. It's all about grace. Now, um, why did I write this book? Like I said, um, I just wanted to share the wonderful miracles that God did in the life of my daughter, Grace, who, when she was three years old, had a significant health problem in Liberia, which was uh, 1986, it was. And God, in his amazing, marvelous grace, you know, we named her Grace, in fact, because we believed when 
were not conceived with grace, we believed that it was God's grace to us. And so she got that name, and then when she was three years old, like I said, she had a significant health problem, and we're gonna share a little bit more about that. Um, and, and because it was so significant, I wanted to, in fact, when it happened, um, people kept saying, you know, you're gonna write about this, and I said, well, maybe one day. But it, it took about 36 years before we finished to put it in print. But it was amazing because 36 years after we had this uh, experience of God's grace on our lives, and um, I had the opportunity to travel back to the USA to meet with the doctors who God used to facilitate the miracle that make grace today is a fully functioning adult, married, working in Germany. So do you want to tell us that story from the beginning and how you got to, to meet the doctors more recently? So tell us about Grace at Three and what happened. Okay. In 1986, I, I was uh, working at David and I was working, David is my husband who passed away sadly about 11 years ago and he used to be part of this church as well. Um, we, we worked at this Christian hospital um, in Liberia, in Monrovia, and we'd been working there for, I think, about three or four years. Grace was born in a different hospital, and my second son, Ab, was born there. So we moved to this hospital in 1984. And um, two years after that, Grace got ill. And the way it happened was, one night, she, I, I was at home with them and David was on call. And then Grace woke up in the middle of her sleep and she came crying, mama, mama, please, my head, my head hurts. And so I said, oh, what happened? Did you fall? Did you hit yourself or something? She said, no, 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 my head hurts. So I just kept her, I said, okay, lay by me, and, um, and let's see, I tried to comfort her. And then um, uh, I called David at work, and I said, look, darling, when you come in, can you bring some carpool for, for Kit Grace? She's got a headache. I said, but it is not usual for a three-year-old to have a headache. So, and she didn't have a fever or anything like that. Now, in Liberia, if you have a headache, you got fever, you got malaria. But she didn't have a headache. I mean, she didn't have fever, she only had the headache. And so as she was sit, lying there in the bed by me, suddenly, Grace started to have a fit. And she's just started, her legs were convulsing. And imagine I was sitting, lying there, looking at her. I'm a doctor, I've been treating people all along. I know children don't have fits unless they're having a high fever or there's something wrong in their brain. And so I didn't know, I thought, what's happened here? Did she have a fall? I couldn't tell what was happening. So I, uh, I waited and then it subsided. And um, then David came and I said, darling, you wouldn't believe what happened. Grace had a fit. And he too stretched his eyes, fit. And then she had another one. <clears throat> Coincidentally, or co God way of doing things, in our house at that time, was a pediatrician from the United States. He'd come, <laughs> he'd come to do research in Liberia for children with malnutrition, and he was staying with us. So he'd just come in maybe about half an hour before Grace had the fit, and um, I knew he wasn't really sleeping, so I went and woke him up. And he came and he said, so we all sat there in, our, in my bedroom looking at her, and then she had another one. And he said, she had any history of epilepsy? No. So we tried to go around with every imaginable thing that we could think about that night. And then we took her, he said, well, we probably have to take her to the hospital. Well, the hospital we worked at was about two minutes walk from where we lived, because we lived on this compound. So we took Grace there, they tried to uh, do a, uh, take some fluid from her back, because we thought maybe it's meningitis, or, but Grace had been fully well all her life, no, for the three years she was, she'd been born, she had no medical problems. She was a healthy three-year-old. 
you know, running all over the place. So they tried to do uh, uh, some fluid out of her back, but they couldn't do it because she wouldn't let them. And then she had another fit in the emergency room. And then she got paralyzed on one side. And then all these three doctors sitting there looking at each other, brain started to work, and we figure out there is something in her brain sitting there. Well, what do you think about? There must be a tumor in her brain, because she didn't have any fever. Of course, we so they decided we're going to keep her. This is Africa. We treat common things more commonly. So they would treat her for malaria. They would treat her for an infection. And that's what we did. And that night, I stayed in the hospital with her while David and this daughter doctor went home. And I prayed all night. And the next morning, she was moving all her limbs, and there was nothing. So they kept her antibiotics and took her home. She continued to have the headaches for a month. But during that time, this doctor who was with us was uh, scheduled to go back to the US. So he said, you know what? I'm going to send a letter. I've got a friend who is a neurosurgeon, I mean neurologist, pediatric neurologist. And I'm going to write him and tell him the story and let him see what he can tell us, what we can do. Now, in Liberia, we had no CAT scan, couldn't do MRI. There was none of those things available. This is 1986. So the thing was, the pediatric neurologist that he was going to write to two years before, and this is how I'm talking about God's grace. Two years before, this pediatric neurologist called Eric had come to our hospital. He's a Christian as well, come to our hospital. And we invited him and his wife, both of them were there, to come to our house for a meal. And so Grace was sort of running around, you know, healthy, and he took a video of Grace running around. So when this uh, pediatrician wrote to him, he said, you know, this is Velma and David's daughter, and I don't know whether you met her before, but what can we do? We, uh, what do you think we should do? And he said, well, when I go, I'll, we send a letter ahead of him because one of our friends, who was a doctor, was going to Chicago the week before he left, so she took the letter with her, posted it in the US so he could get it quicker. Well, Dave and Ricken, who was staying with us, the pediatrician, went back to the US after a week. And he said, look, when I get there, I'll call him and ask him what to do. When he went, the letter this man was writing him came to, the, to Liberia with his name on it. Well, because he was a missionary, um, the, 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 um, the missions decided that they were going to send a letter back to America. And this letter had all the information about what to do about grace. But it was, direct, it was uh, addressed to Dave and Rican. So he, they decided they were going to send a letter back. His aunt, who was also one of the missionaries on the, uh, on the campus, they sent the letters to her and said, look, Dave and Rican has gone back to the US. Can you send these letters to him? God's grace again. She looked at the letter. And it had the return address was a doctor from Chicago. So she thought, is there anything in here about grace? So she called the man who and her nephew were doing the research together and said, look, are you expecting any mail from a doctor in Chicago? He said, no. She said, well, I've got this letter I'm about to send back to the US. But I know um, Dave was concerned about grace and he wrote to this neurosurgeon, do you think it could have anything in it? And the doctor said, well, open the letter. If it has nothing to do with grace, well, put it back in and send it to him. Fortunately, she opened the letter and the letter said, actually the letter was directed to me and David, dear David and Velma, I remember grace, I have a recording of her. I think you should bring her right away because it could be a brain tumor. 
And then he said, at the end of the letter, he said, come as soon as you can. Do not worry about the money. Well, when we got that letter, we thought, do not worry about the money. You can't go to America with no money. But then we prayed and we believed and we had everybody praying for us on the campus and we decided we're gonna go to America. <laughs> and we left Liberia about, so by the time Grace had the first uh, fit till the time we went to the US, it was about four weeks. Before we took her to America, David and I sat and held hands around Grace on the bed. And we prayed and we asked God that whatever it was that was in her head, in her brain, he should keep it right there and it shouldn't move a stitch anywhere until we got help. Because we knew that we had the experience that two, one of our teachers in medical school, his son had had uh, a brain abscess years before and they're taking him to Nigeria and he died. We didn't know what it was in Grace's head. We thought it was uh, a tumor or something. But we were just praying all the time that whatever it was, God should just hold it in one place. So we took her to America. And the day we got there, we got there about two o'clock in the afternoon. And um, Dr. Zerberg, who was a pediatric neurologist who wrote the letter to us in Liberia, he said to the family we stayed with that when we get there, just call him and he'd made arrangements for her to have a CAT scan. Fast, let me back up a little bit. The year 1986, David and I went to the US in February and we spent five months there taking, uh, studying to take the American exams to go and do training in the US. And this was in, when we came back in July, this was when Grace got sick. And while we were in America, we met up with Dave Van Rieken, who was the pediatrician. And he said to us, I'm coming to Liberia to do a research in about a month. He said, can I stay with you? And we said, oh, that's fine, no problem. Now, he didn't need to stay with us. We lived on this campus, SRM, they had guest house. He had his aunt there, he could have stayed with anybody. Why he chose to stay with us was only God knowing ahead what was gonna happen that he would be in our house the night Grace had the fit, that he would be able to contact this pediatric ne neurologist in Chicago. Who would say, bring her? Who would arrange with a pediatric, with a neurosurgeon in the same Chicago? These are all Christians. The pediatric neurosurgeon didn't know us at all. Never met him before. The pediatric neurologist came to our house two years before and met with our family. But he didn't know us personally. And so when we got to Chicago, he made the arrangement, we went and got the CAT scan. And when we saw the CAT scan, he didn't know what it was, neither did I. And so we stood there and we said, he said, what do you think this is? And this is, we got there at two o'clock, this is at seven o'clock. So five hours after we arrived in the US, with no money, we had a CAT scan done in one of the best hospitals in Chicago. Two hours after that, we went to the house of the neurosurgeon, one of the best neurosurgeons in South Chicago. And the neurosurgeon, when we saw him, he said, um, do you see these kind of things in Liberia, in Africa? I said, no, because we haven't got a CAT scan anyway. Just, even if it was there, we only treat people empirically. And then he said to me, 
Well, this has been going on for a month, so we're going to have to do the surgery tonight. Are you okay with that? He said, because the next two weeks, I'm really booked up. I've got too many cases, and this has been going on for a month. We don't know where it is, and we notice it's an abscess in the back of our head, the size of a, grape, a small grapefruit. It had shifted her brain all the way to one side. And so I said, well, that's the reason we came. We up for it. So we went. He said, okay, go straight to the hospital, and I will call there and tell them to admit her. And when they've done all their missions, I'll come and do the surgery tonight. And sure enough, within about 9 o'clock, we'd done all the admissions. They called him, he came, and did the surgery. And by 1 o'clock in the morning, I was in that hospital. Loyola University Medical Center, which is a Catholic Jesuit hospital. I had no money. They admitted us without any... Uh, she asked me, the woman asked me, she said, do you have insurance? I said, no, we only came from Africa today. <laughs> she said, okay. They admitted us. They called the surgeon, he came, and they did the surgery in three hours. And then he came down and said to me, Velma, it was an abscess. In fact, he said, there was a big one, and then there was a little one. He said, and we got 10 milliliters of pus out of her head. He said, but she's okay. She's crying and she's calling for you. It was only me, down in the lobby of that hospital, praying for the last how many hours. And I went and saw Grace, and she was in uh, ICU for three or four days on antibiotics. And then after a week, he said, they did another scan, he said, we gotta do another surgery because we didn't get everything out. So they had a second surgery. And by that time, we were all panicking. What, what if, what's gonna happen? And then she was still on antibiotics and two weeks later, they did another CAT scan and he said, what I see there, I have to go back for the third time because we didn't get everything out. He said, are you okay with me doing that? I said, if it was your child, what would you do? He said, I'll go in. I said, well, then do it. So he went and he had the third surgery. And when they came down after about six hours, that was the only one they did that day, he said to me, we cut almost everything out, you see, and we're really pleased. And so Grace was in hospital for five weeks. No, f yeah, for five weeks. And at the end of the fifth week, we went to the, he invited us to the church where his father-in-law was the uh, pastor of a Lutheran church there. And he was... Uh, it was All Saints Day, you know, the first Sunday in, in November. And uh, <clears throat> we went to the church, and he introduced us, and he said, this three-year-old is also a saint. And there was a 99-year-old lady who they were celebrating. He said, this is God's grace here. We've got a three-year-old who has experienced a miracle, and we've got a 99-year-old who is still living by the grace of God. 36 years later, we went back to the U.S. in July 2022. And we met the doctor. And he couldn't, he said to me, he said, if we had to do it now, that surgery would do it completely different. He said, and it wouldn't take me three surgeries to get everything out. But so I said, well, what would have happened? He said, well, actually, when he, when he did the final surgery, he said, um, I said, would she have any lasting effects? He said, well, no, maybe just her, it's near her reading center. She might just have a little problem with her reading. Well, Grace was a free reader before she went to school. So she had no problems with reading. 
She only had to be on some anti-epileptic drug for about three years, and then she was fine. Um, she came to certain girls, and she had one seizure there, and then we had to put her back on treatment. And after, I think, two years, she was taken off it, and she hasn't had any problems since. Now, the bill, I said we didn't have any money. <laughs> We went to the U.S. I said, well, we can't go to the people country and go to the hospital and not pay anything. So the day before we left Liberia, uh, one of our missionary friends called me and she said, Thelma, my father died about a year ago and my inheritance just came through. She said, and I believe God wants us to give you $1,000 to go to help with your treatment. So. By that time, I used to make 250 US dollars as a doctor working in. So my salary went to help us to go to America. And then my parents helped us. So I carried two and a half thousand dollars with me. So when Grace was discharged from the hospital, I said to the business office, I said, look, this is what I have. And she said, um, OK, just when you go back, just pay us a little bit every month. Now, listen to the bill. This is 1986. Just the hospital bill, the ICU and stuff, was 40,000 US dollars. The surgeon who did the three surgeries, all the pediatricians who they consulted, all the anesthesiologists, none of them charged us a penny. But we still had a $40,000 bill to pay. So, before we left the U.S., we had some friends send us money, so we paid a $4,000. And over the year, we, my salary went to pay for the hospital bill. And after a year, just around Thanksgiving time in Liberia, I got a letter from the hospital, and they said, Velma, you and David have done very well. And the hospital, you are helping sick people in Africa. And the hospital decided we're going to cancel the rest of your bill. So we paid about 15000 uh, in all, and they, they canceled the rest of the bill. Wow. So you've written all of this in the book. Life hasn't been straightforward. There's been, there's been very difficult moments. And you talked about briefly your mm -hmm. husband David died. How do you reconcile this? We're moving off the questions to the questions people are asking. How do you balance the incredible things that God has done and the really difficult moments that you've lived through? And you live through a nation that's been in, in real, real turmoil. How do you handle those highs and lows? Right. Um, you know, I became a, a 50 years ago, July, this last July, I became a Christian. Um, I was at university at the time. And I remember asking there some verses in scripture that really hold on to. Um, when I first became a Christian, we were encouraged to read the book of John. So I kind of chewed that. And one verse in John, when Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I think I grabbed that one. And there were, when, I, when I became a Christian, I asked God for two things. I said, Lord, two things I'd like to ask you for. One is, will you give me a husband who loves you? I didn't even say whether he should love me. He just loved God. Because I thought, if you love God, the rest will follow. I said, and the, the other thing I said, God, please don't let anything happen to me that will stop me from loving you. And because of that, uh, my growth in my faith has been, yeah, there have been difficult times. And like we say, what happened in our country, the war and the struggles. But I think I've never shifted. And I can only say it's the grace of God to keep me there, really, that I've never shifted. Um, and I think being focused and staying in the word has kept me. 
And like I say, and I know it is not, you know, the, the verse that says, not by any works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the regeneration and washing of the Holy Spirit. And so it's not, I just, I'm so in awe of how God goes ahead of me. He prepares things. And I mean, sending this doctor to our house ahead of time before the problem occurred, that he was there. All these things, I don't take it lightly and I don't see it as just coincidences. I see it as God's provision. And when we had the, the, the for example, before we came to England, um, the war in Liberia started in December of 1989. We heard all oh, the people invading the country. And by that time, David was planning, we were thinking about David coming back to the UK to do orthopedics. Now, I wasn't supposed to come. I was supposed to stay in Liberia with the children. And then until he got settled here. And then one missionary doctor said to us, um, she said, are you going to the UK with David? We said, no, we're not. And I was pregnant at the time. I said, no, we wait until he gets settled. And she said, well, you never know how this thing would unfold. So I suggest it would be a good thing if you could all go. I said, what? And it was in January, December. Then the war started. And uh, we were thinking, well, what are we going to do? And then we prayed and we asked God, what shall we do? And I know it may sound like, how do you ask God? We pray and we wait and we listen. And oftentimes he will send people to us. Often, or we will even get the, the, the sense of what we're meant to do. And so we made a decision to come to England together. And when we came, God provided so much. We landed in, in, in London and we went to a service only to find that there was somebody in that church who knew somebody to the place where we were going. And there was a church there that the person was going to. And he said to us, oh, I know somebody 20 years ago we worked together in London, and they live in that, you know, in the area you're going. And now, uh, this is their name. And when you go, look for them. Only for us to get there to find out the people were in the identical church we, that was just near where we were, and that church became our home. They looked after us. They cared for us day and night um, as we live in, in in Liverpool until we moved to Sutton. So. God just provides for us. So in times of difficulties, well, we fell back on the goodness of God. You know the song we sing sometimes? Uh, I think it comes out of Bethel. Your goodness is running after me. Mm. Oh, my goodness. That song, just, it's just my song. The goodness of God chases me. And, and, and like I say, it's nothing that I do. I don't deserve this. You know, I... I make mistakes like everybody, but God's grace and his, his goodness, it's like, it's sort of there for the taking. <laughs> Two or three years ago, we did a Questions of Life and we talked about racism and, and yourself and Paulette gave your story. And I know if we watch that and people go back and find it on our, you've experienced racism in this country, in this, in this town. How do you remain full of grace when you have experienced. You're very, you know, the people say, oh, everything goes well for Velma, but I know that's not true. <laughs> and I know you've experienced prejudice and difficulty. So how do you, how do you keep on being full of grace? Well, the, you know, they say, he who has been forgiven much loves much, but he who has been giving more grace also gives grace. Um, like I say, because of my own experience with the love of God, when I got saved, Donald, it's like I was overwhelmed by the love of God and the grace of God for me. And so it's been just my experience. I gave what I receive. I, I don't manufacture. 
when I, re I receive grace from God, so I'm able to give the grace. I receive love from God, I'm able to give that. And, and, and because God, he just helps me. That the only thing I can say, for example, you are saying about experiencing racism. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, the, <laughs> before, we, before we moved to the house we're in now, um, I remember one, <laughs> one day we, we went with some f friends, we, family we have from Manchester, and we went to the house to see, you know, the house we were moving to. And um, we didn't think anything about it. And then after we moved to the house, I saw this slip of paper on the, on the, uh, on the, <laughs> on the uh, drive. Um, and so I picked it up. And on the slip of paper it was written there, oh, um, did you see the 12 black faces on your, on your, uh, in front of your house today? Now, this was about probably a week or two after we, you know, we'd gone to see the house. And I kept thinking, God, why did this paper, this little piece of paper remain here for me to see it? Because it could have been thrown away where it was part of the, you know, the rubbish. But I saw it, but it didn't, I saw it and I thought, oh, so we probably got a little bit of a problem on this road. <laughs> But that didn't stop me because you know what I did? We moved to that house and I went and knocked on every door on that road and I said, hello, <laughs> we just moved to the top of the road. My name is Velma and you know, I, who are you? And so I went and knocked on everybody's door so I knew everybody on the road. And, and there was a, another Christian, somebody told me a Christian living straight to the bottom. So I said to her, I said, you know what? We're gonna pray for everybody on this road. So every week, we used to meet and pray for all the people on the road. So when people offend me or when people do stuff to me, sometimes I say I'm not easily offended, okay? But if I think about it again or it comes to me and I thought, oh, well, then I go straight to God with it. And I say, Lord, this thing is hurting me. What shall I do? And somehow God gives me the grace to let it go. Or he will say to me, where you pray about that. I remember one time, somebody was upsetting me all the time and just saying things to annoy me. And like I say, it kept coming to me. One night I was sleeping and I said, God, what shall I do about this? Shall I go and talk to the person about it? And it's like, God said to me, no. And I said, well, what shall I do? He said, you find a way. And I thought about it. And I said, well, I'm going to do something really nice. So I invited the person to my house. And I said, what do you want me to pray for? And the person said, this, that, and the rest of it. So I said, OK, I'll support you in this. And I'll pray for you. I'll pray for what you'd like. And you know, all that aggro stopped just like that. No aggro. There's something about loving people who don't love you. There is such a power in that. And it, if you draw on the grace from God, then you're able to do it. And I think there's somewhere in the Bible it talks about pouring, uh, it's like pouring, putting coals on the person's head. Mm. Okay. Romans 12. Yeah. But I think if your attitude is not ready, to, I don't want to burn your head, but I just want to show God's grace to you. We had a neighbor one time, a young man on our road, and for whatever reason, he was just always, he, he came to our house one Sunday afternoon, and he said something like, well, why do you have, he said, why do you have three cars, you Christians? This is what he said. And I said, well, he was having this talk with David at the door. And so David was getting really annoyed with this man. So I was sort of in the kitchen and I closed, turned the cooker over. I came out and I said, well, what's the problem here? He said, oh, I want you to move the car from on the road. We had this uh, of vanette that uh, we bought when the children were around. And uh, we're about to send it back to Africa for them to use in the hospital there for people with AIDS. So uh, HIV and AIDS. So we had it parked and we're getting ready to, to ship it to, to, to Africa. And um, so I said, what's the problem? He said, well, 
I want you to move your car because uh, they, <laughs> they, they're bringing a, um, a skip tomorrow. And I said, oh, no worries. I just went, got the key, moved the car, parked it down to the bottom of the road. And so David didn't say anything. So I said, we're not making any fuss about this. About two weeks later, the, the uh, container truck came to pick the stuff up to carry. So when he, the man from the container truck, you know, rang the bell, we came outside and said, oh, he said, I came to pick up this van. So he said, you got a funny neighbor. I said, what do you mean? You only been here for five minutes. How you know I got a funny neighbor? He said, well, as soon as I brought the container truck, he brought his car and parked it on the road, which meant people coming down had to, you know, it was going to be difficult for them. I said, oh, don't worry about him. That Christmas, we decided we're going to buy the biggest box of Cadbury chocolate you could find. And all six of us, <laughs> all six of us, we went to the house and we rang the bell. <laughs> and he came outside, he came to the door and said, you know, you only moved here about six months ago and we live right across. We know he knew where we were. We said, um, um, but we just wanted to bless you. And in my heart, I thought, I don't care what you do with this chocolate. If you throw it in the bin, I don't care. But well, I'm making a point. So we gave him the chocolate. He said, oh, thank you very much. And we left. He's moved from our road now. But it, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was just interesting that we, we said we're going to bless him with the <laughs> whole biggest box of chocolate we could find. Brilliant. Time's beating us. I want to ask one more question that somebody sent in. Um, We'll probably slightly delicately say that most people here are younger than, than you. Mm. What advice would you give to a younger, maybe a younger woman, or just a younger person? What advice would you give? If you could say one thing I wish I'd known when I was younger. Right. Well, you know, this, this morning I was talking to Alison and, and, and Laurie here. I really enjoyed the, the, you know, the service this morning. It spoke to my heart. But, and I said to them, uh, there's this song that I learned some years ago. And it says, it goes like this. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And so I just say to you, if you're a young woman, you know, you fall in love with somebody. You, know, you don't know who you fall in love with. Sometimes you just fall in love with a boy or a man. And as you keep falling in love with him, maybe one day you get married to him. Well, I suggest keep falling in love with Jesus. Keep falling in love with Jesus. Get to know him. And on a, a practical uh, thing is, if you make your faith as practical as you can, don't depend on yourself. Jesus will help you. And I think one of the ways we struggle is when we think we can do it. We can't do it. We can't live the Christian life by yourself. But you keep falling in love with Jesus. You, you keep asking the Holy Spirit to help you. I call these things arrow prayers. I do arrow prayers hundreds of times a day. You know, the arrow prayers, Lord, help me. God, show me. Make prayer your everyday thing, your, your eating and your drinking. You know, I think it is a, as you surrender your life to God. In Romans 12, one talks about making our lives a living sacrifice. It gets easier, and it also gets harder. But it, most of the time, it will be easy. If you let Jesus take charge of you, if you let um, 
if you fall in love with him. That's the only way I can say it, Arnold. No, it's, I've yeah. never heard that song yeah. sung. You keep falling in love, yeah, fall in love with Jesus. Then I said it was going to be the last question. This is the last question. If you could sum up what it is that you love about Jesus, if you could choose three or five words that just say, this is why I love Jesus. I'm going to get told off for asking you hard questions. No, no. Um, I love Jesus because of, I can only say again, because of his grace for me, really. And the way he, he cares for us. Jesus cares about every single thing about our lives. Um, before I, became, I went to medical school, I had to ask Jesus, I stayed, actually I stopped for a week and just spent time with the Lord. And to get to know Jesus is to spend time with him. Spend time with him. Jesus is he's gracious, he's kind, he's compassionate. Um, I've been watching, I binged watch. You binge watch or you watch uh, Baywatch? No, I binge. <laughs> binge watch. I binge watch the, the Chosen. Okay. I'm telling you. I binge watch The Chosen. And because The Chosen is not, didn't really, it's a, you know, it didn't go didactically with the Bible, they make Jesus very, I can call it very accessible. It's helped me in so many ways. And Keep growing in the Lord. So when, you watch, when I watch The Chosen, you can see the humanity of Jesus there, but you also see the supernatural Jesus. And I'd just like to encourage you that our faith in God is supernatural. God is supernatural. And you, we need to recognize that it is the supernatural power of God that enables us to live. And, and so... Um, yeah, just spend time with Jesus. Okay. That's the only thing I can do. Okay, brilliant. I'm going to ask Joel to come back and, and lead us, because we're going to sing Amazing Grace, I think, which I think was appropriate. But as Joel and the band come back, let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this story of your amazing compassion and intervention in little Grace's life and the saving of her life through a remarkable set of events. But we thank you too for Velma's story of your faithfulness, of your care and compassion, of your goodness running after her. And we pray for each one of us here, whether we're crying out to God for an intervention or whether we are able to celebrate the goodness of God at hand, we pray that we may all know your love. Help us to follow Velma's advice to seek you and to love you every day. We thank you for your love and care for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.